Hi, this is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting section 5.1 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This section focuses on engagement of the coronary arteries and bypass grafts using femoral axis. Engagement is the fifth of the 14 steps of percutaneous coronary intervention, and it is essential both for diagnostic and geography, as well as percutaneous coronary intervention. Engagement can be broken down to nine steps, which will be discussed one by one. The first step is to select the catheter that will be used to engage the coronary artery or bypass graft. There is more detail on this on video 5.3. However, some basic concepts are here, including the various roles of catheters, which are both to engage, inject contrast, monitor the pressure, and also deliver equipment such as balloons and stents. There are multiple factors regarding catheter selection, including the diagnostic or guide catheter type, the shape of the catheter, the size, the length, the presence or not of side holes, and the catheter surface. These are some of the most commonly used catheters for diagnostic angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention. For the left, diagnostic is usually done with a Judkins left 4, and intervention with an EBU and XB guide. For the right, diagnostic and geography is usually done with the JR4 or Williams, and PCI for simple lesions with the JR4 and for complex lesions with an AL1 guide. For grafts to the right, the JR4 can sometimes engage those grafts, but due to the downward orientation, a multipurpose works best. For left-sided grafts, JR4 is often successful in performing diagnostic and geography or the left coronary bypass or LCB catheter, but for PCI, AL1 provides more support. And then for internal mammary, the JR4 can often engage the IEM graft. However, for PCI, also the IEM can be used in cases of difficulty engaging. One can use the VB1 or the, G, the GYM catheter. The second step is to advance a guide wire, O35 or O38 usually, to the aortic root. This is the wire over which the catheter will then be advanced to the coronary ostium. This can sometimes be done by preloading the wire into the catheter. And then uh, the catheter is inserted into the sheath after the sheath has been aspirated and flushed. After the catheter is inserted, then the wire is advanced from the back end of the catheter. And then they are both moved together until the wire reaches the aortic cusp then the wire is kept in place while the catheter is being delivered to the ascending aorta. Sometimes the guide wire may enter branches, for example here it's going to the left subclavian artery. In such cases the wire is pulled back and redirected into the ascending aorta. What to do if there is resistance to guide wire advancement? This is described in detail in video 5.5, but the key concept is to not push hard. The third step is to advance the catheter all the way to the aortic root next to the ostia of the coronary arteries or the bypass grafts. If the catheter has not been preloaded on the wire, then the catheter is inserted over the back end of the O35 or O38 guide wire after the catheter is flushed. This is one way to hold the catheter to avoid the catheter moving around and potentially getting contaminated or falling, falling out of the table. The catheter is inserted with the back end between the fourth and fifth fingers of the operator. This way both ends of the catheter are in the operator's hands and there is complete control of the catheter position. Also when a guide is used, especially large ones such as a 7 or 8 French guide, it is best to pre-connect the guide with a TUI so that there is no significant bleeding while the catheter is being advanced into the aorta. This way there is hemostasis at the back end of the catheter, whereas the catheter can still be advanced over the O35 or O38 wire. So the wire comes to the aortic root, then the catheter is advanced over the wire, the wire is removed and the catheter is now in place. What to do if there is resistance to advancing the catheter? There is a separate video for this, as discussed before, but the key concept is to not push hard. Instead, try to understand what is the reason for the resistance and try to solve the problem. 
Sometimes the catheter can be short and not long enough to reach the coronary ostium. For example, in patients with severe aortic tortuosity, such as this patient, or very tall patients. And in such patients, there are 125 cm long catheters, which are longer than the standard 100 cm long catheters, and can be used to engage the coronary ostia. One potential complication during advancement of the catheter is ventricular ectopy, or even ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation. The reason is that uh, the O35 wire may go into the left ventricle and then essentially cause ectopy or ventricular arrhythmias. This is the same example. This is the wire into the aortic root, then prolapses into the ventricle, causing ectopy. The wire is pulled back and the catheter delivered. So it is critical to monitor the EKG and the tip of the O35 wire during catheter advancement to prevent this wire prolapse into the ventricle. This is especially important when there's left ventricular thrombus to avoid dislodgement of this thrombus and systemic embolization. The fourth step, and a critical step, is to aspirate the catheter. The reason is that if there is material in the catheter, we want to prevent embolization in the coronary arteries or elsewhere. So after the catheter is in place into the ascending aorta, down to the coronary cusps, the guide wire, the O35 or O38, is being removed. And then if it is pre-connected to the TUI, the TUI is back bled until blood comes back. And then uh, the reason for doing this is to remove any potential pieces of plaque, cholesterol, or frank pieces of atheroma. Or sometimes thrombus can be in the sheath and being picked up from the catheter when it's advanced through the sheath. Sometimes there can be air into the catheter and the line, and that also needs to be aspirated to prevent air embolization. What to do if uh, uh, there is difficulty aspirating? The first step is to slightly withdraw the catheter, because the most common reason for resistance to aspiration is that the catheter is against the wall of the aorta, or is against the tight ostia lesion, or in a small coronary branch. So by slightly pulling it back, then often uh, it is possible to aspirate. If that fails, the next step is to perform fluoroscopy of the catheter to look for kinking, because kinking can also prevent aspiration. If that is the case, the kink catheter is removed. If not, and we still cannot aspirate the catheter, despite pulling it back, it is critical to just remove the catheter without aspirating or injecting or inserting a guide wire. The reason being, if there is material inside the catheter, we don't want to inject it into the circulation. Instead, we want to remove everything. And then after we do this, then we can flush the catheter outside the body to see what was the problem. In the end, always want to aspirate the sheath because quite often the reason for the difficulty aspirating is sheath thrombus that was inserted into the catheter and plugged it up. Step number five is to connect the catheter with the manifold. And this is usually done in a fluid-to-fluid -fluid connection, followed by aspiration to ensure once again that there is no air or debris into the line. Typically, the preparation is done with the catheter and the manifold being tilted up. So if there is any air or other material inside the uh, manifold that goes on the top of the syringe and is not injected into the coronary arteries or the bypass grafts. So vertical orientation of the manifold is important. What can go wrong if uh, there is no cleaning of the catheter and materials in the catheter? Systemic embolization with stroke or other places can occur or air embolization can occur. Key preventive measure is to always aspirate the sheath that is done with one syringe, then that syringe and the blood is discarded, and a separate syringe with clear normal saline is used to flush the catheter. Step number six is to ensure that there is good pressure waveform. The reason is that if there is dampening, that uh, may result in dissection or ischemia during injection. We want a waveform like this. If there is dampening, as in this case, there should be no injection because they can cause dissection or other significant complications. Instead, the catheter is repositioned until a good pressure waveform is obtained. This is an example of engaging the right coronary artery. The catheter goes into a small conus branch with significant dampening. The catheter disengaged 
and the dampening correct. This is another example of dampening, which is also called uh, pressure ventricularization. And yet another example, once again, injection should not happen when there's dampening because of the risk of dissection and other complications. What to do if there's pressure dampening? The first step, similar with failure to aspirate, is to slightly pull the catheter back in case it is against the wall or it's against an osteo lesion. If the pressure is not correcting, then the next step is to aspirate the catheter again in case there is any plaque or other material inside the catheter. The next step is to check the transducer. Sometimes there are issues with the transducer. Fourth step is to perform fluoroscopy of the catheter to exclude kinking. Fifth step is uh, similar to the inability to aspirate, to just remove the entire catheter without putting a wire back in, without injecting, and then finish by aspirating the sheath. This is material that came out of catheters. These were likely formed into the sheath, and then um, it went into the catheter when the catheter was inserted through the clotted sheath. Once again, no pressure, no good pressure waveform. You should never inject. Step number seven is to manipulate the catheter to engage the coronary ostia. This is discussed in, vi in video 5.7. The key goals here is to not have pressure dampening, to have coaxial engagement, and an intubation depth of the coronary artery of two to three millimeters. More deep intubation can cause ventricularization or potential dissections, and also may in not allow good visualization of the coronary tree. Less intubation may result in unstable catheter position and loss of position during contrast injection. How is the catheter manipulation done? Both hands are working together. The left hand does back and forth movements, and the right hand does clockwise and counterclockwise rotation. A common misconception, especially early in training, is to do a lot of rotation with the right hand with minimal movement of the catheter with the left hand. In reality, the opposite should happen. Most of the movement is back and forth movement using the left hand with only mild rotation with the right hand. This is the basic manipulation for engaging the left main. The wire is advanced to the coronary cusps, the catheter is advanced, the gut wire is withdrawn, and then the catheter is advanced into the left cusp. On the right coronary, same concept, and then the catheter is rotated clockwise until it turns and engages the right coronary. This is an example of clockwise rotation and engagement of the right coronary artery. In terms of the bypass grafts, for bypass grafts to the right, there is up and down movement. This is a multi-purpose catheter until the catheter catches the ostium of the coronary bypass. And for engaging grafts to the left, there is back and forth movement of the catheter again with slight clockwise rotation usually until uh, the catheter enters into the ostium of the bypass graft. For the lima, the catheter is usually advanced in the ascending aorta, and then it goes up, sometimes it engages the brachiocephalic, left common carotid, until it finally falls into the left subclavian. Then the catheter is advanced, usually with a wire, all the way to the origin of the IMA, and then with counterclockwise rotation, the IMA origin is cannulated. What to do if uh, there is uh, not uh, success in engaging? The first question to ask is whether the location of the coronary or bypass graft ostia is understood, because sometimes we try to find the coronary where we expect it to be, but there may be variation, for example, anomalous coronary arteries, or the coronary may be totally occluded at the ostium. In such cases, performing cusp angiography or full aortography can help clarify what is the location of the coronary ostium. If we understand the location, the next question is whether it is easy to manipulate the catheter, advance back and forth and torque, and if not, the issue may be that uh, there is poor control of the catheter. That can be improved by inserting an 035 wire in the catheter, using a long 45 centimeter or 23 centimeter sheath, using a diagnostic catheter, which are thicker than the guides and easier to manipulate, using smaller catheters than the sheath, or sometimes changing axis. 
if cutter manipulations are okay. The next question is, is the right cutter size? If not, different cutter size should be used. The cutter size is typically based on the size of the order. The next step is to try different cutter shapes. And then if everything fails, then uh, one may have to stop and look for other ways to visualize the coronary arteries, for example, with CT and geography. There are potential complications of advancing the catheter, such as uh, spasm with radial axis, and that is discussed separately on video 5.9, and then kicking of the catheter that is uh, discussed uh, on video 5.10. The next step is once again to ensure good pressure waveform before performing in geography. There should be no injection with this pressure waveform. And uh, the reason we're doing this is to prevent complications like this, a massive left main dissection going to the LAD and to the circumflex. And after this is done, then we're ready for contrast injection. That will be discussed uh, separately on Chapter 6. Thank you.